I was brought up in South London near Crystal Palace. We came up here on family holidays from the time I was just nine and I knew after that holiday that this was where I wanted to live. This was kind of my spiritual home. There was something about the space. You'd be away from that continual hum of traffic and busyness, which I've never felt very connected with. I'm an ecologist and I specialise in upland ecology, montane ecology, and in recent years I've become much more involved in deer management as being one of the kind of main strands of ecological challenge in this part of the world. I live near Fort William and um, most of my work is on the west coast of Scotland, which is what brought me to Glen Nevis. I first started to look here at the condition of the woodland around about 10 years ago and I've now spent really quite a lot of time trawling through the woodland here and also surveying ecological condition on the, on the mountains around. If we want to look at Glen Nevis, you want to ask the question, is the ecosystem healthy? Um, I think the answer is probably yes and no. Um, many of the processes here are pretty healthy. Uh, the quality of the water, the quality of the air is pretty good. Having said that, one of the big pressures here in, in Scotland is the presence of large herbivores without predators. So deer are having an impact here, which is not necessarily helpful for the future of the woodland. Um, and, and one of the challenges is to continue to protect areas of regeneration from deer impact. And that means that people have to manage those herbivores. I, other hunters, are assuming that role as predator, which those predators which we've lost and some people would like to reintroduce would otherwise carry out. Proposals for um, bigger predators, lynx, possibly wolf, just won't work whilst there is any kind of agricultural production in the highlands. If you choose to go down that route, what are you going to do with the people who currently occupy that land? And firstly, those people have occupied that land often for generations or centuries, and it is their cultural heritage. We've had one lot of clearances, probably people are pretty reluctant to go down the route of a second lot. Um, often the alternative, one of the main alternatives for rewilding socioeconomics is ecotourism. It's a model which encourages people to travel further, burn more fossil fuels. It takes away agricultural productivity. So our options for accessing produce from close at hand disappears, we would then be guilty of moving that production somewhere else for somebody else to carry out, which means that their options for wilderness are disappearing. And on a global scale, that's a social injustice. And I don't want to see a model of environmental protection which only gives people who are wealthy enough the opportunity to engage and live in and access wild places. That seems to me to be a perpetuation of the system that doesn't work in the first place. We need to grasp the issues of a burgeoning global population that we can't feed, let alone provide high quality environment for. People really would like to think that nature was quite nice. And I think when they see that it can be pretty brutal, that can be quite difficult. It's about our, our, our nature of not wanting to see some of the stark realities and the stark choices that we have. And a lot of that is, is around our food. I eat meat. I choose very carefully where my meat comes from. I eat venison that I shoot from the point at which that deer is in my rifle scope to the point where that steak is on my plate. I know exactly what happened to that meat. We should be a lot more open about some of the more difficult aspects of food production. And it doesn't matter whether it's, it's, it's um, livestock production or um, vegetable production, because all of them have an impact on nature and wildlife.
it's how it's got to your plate that's really important. Whether you should eat meat or not meat or vegetables or grains, that is too simplistic an argument. I would like to see a shift in the context of, of climate change in particular. In order to protect nature, you actually need to restore processes. And what it produces actually isn't that important. What's important is that the processes are strong and resilient and will adapt to change. And we won't tolerate the brutality of nature as it sorts its system out for itself. It, it's symptomatic of this bigger issue of the divorce between people and their environment, um, which as we become more surrounded by technology and more urbanized, that divorce just gets worse. So today we are trying to shoot a hind or a hind and a calf. Um, it's part of the cull that needs to come from this piece of woodland. We're at the moment watching a hind and a, a knobber, so that's a, a yearling stag, grazing hopefully towards us. Um, and we're waiting to see where she goes. A lot of people say to me, you know, how, how, can you, how can you bear it, you know, shooting things and skinning them and doing all of that? And it's like, well, if I can't do that, I shouldn't, I've no right to eat meat. I need to be able to do that. Why, can I, why should I expect somebody else to do that on my behalf? We hate talking about death. We loathe it, but we also don't like seeing it. And being connected with nature makes you, forces you to look at, brutal reality because it happens all the time they, they like to think that nature is nice and fluffy it's not i hate not doing it cleanly you know if i'm going to cull deer i need to do it in such a way that um they have a really quick humane death there's no suffering that's really important to me uh, it's the bit i don't enjoy um because uh, there's a lot of pressure. I put myself under a lot of pressure to do it well. Um, and inherently, I don't like killing things. But this has to be done. And I like the product. I eat meat. I think anybody who eats meat should at least understand how this works, even if they're not willing to do it themselves. I think that's really important. I limit some of my choices, but I don't do without a vehicle. I don't not take flights. I don't not travel. I'm still choosing to do things that really I probably ought not to choose to do because I am unwilling to put myself outside social norms. And as long as the social norm is the consumption of everything, um, we will not make a lot of difference. I continue to get whenever I'm in these places real spiritual enrichment the negatives only really start to overwhelm me when I don't get outside just being here is enriching in a way that you know sat in front of a computer screen is absolutely the opposite so when in doubt go out <laughs>